Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to the final John Gardner James Bond continuation novel review. Mm, Bollinger. I kid, of course, it's not Bollinger, it's just some Prosecco. <laughs> But hey, a little bit of fizz feels appropriate, because, uh, yes, the surprisingly prolific continuation author's tenure comes to an end with 1996's Cold. Or Coldfall, as I believe it goes by in the US. Uh, I suppose that Gardner knew that this was going to be his final Bond novel going in, because the book is dedicated to the executives and staff of Glidrose Publications, the owners of the James Bond literary copyright. Previous books have been dedicated to his friends and family, and this feels like a very final <laughs> like, you know, uh, he thanks them for having so much confidence in him uh, and having given him so much assistance and help over the past 16 years. So, with that in mind, Gardner clearly decided that if this was going to be his last <laughs> Bond novel, he was going to go Avengers Infinity War with this and bring back a bunch of characters from the past and repurpose them in different ways. First thing to note, that Gardner is doing something very different with the timeline here. Uh, Cold is a story of two halves. The first half takes place around 1990, or at least four years after the events of Nobody Lives Forever, and then the second half of the story shifts to the mid-90s, picking up immediately after the events of Seafire. In the broad strokes as well, the events of this story take place prior to the events of John Gardner's GoldenEye, which I guess if you were to put all of his stories out into a timeline, his GoldenEye novelization would technically be the end of his Bond's timeline. And yet there are a couple of details in here that don't quite match up with that. It ends up being a little bit of a mess, but <laughs> hey, final book, who cares, right? We'll get into this in a bit more detail as I go through the book's story. So expect spoilers galore as usual. It's very hard to talk about this story in particular without revealing a couple of the major plot twists, so be warned. So not to, you know, just begin the video talking about some grievances, but hey, this is John Gardner. Um, Given the slight reboot that I felt like he gave the format in Seafire with Bond like working for Microglobe One now and Flickr and the whole committee kind of thing, I actually kind of liked the shakeup, even if I didn't like that dynamic as much as, you know, the classic format. Uh, I did think it was a bit of a shame that for the first half of this book anyway, we're set in the past, so we are in that classic setup. We are at Bond going into M's office and, you know, receiving his mission, and I understand why that has to happen for this particular story to work, but I also feel like maybe Gardner wanted an excuse to go back to that classic format with this being his last book and all. Anyway, the story begins in a very straightforward manner. Uh, Bond is in M's office and he gets his briefing for his mission. A Boeing 747 belonging to Bradbury Airlines uh, blows up on landing at an airport just outside of Washington, D.C., and Bond is told to investigate. But there is a personal aspect to this because Bond's former lover, Suki Tempesta, is on the passenger manifest and everyone on board the plane has died. So if you cast your minds back to several reviews ago, Suki was actually the main Bond girl of Nobody Lives Forever, which I would cite as being my favourite of Gardner's books. Uh, Bond became entangled with her during that mission, she's an English-Italian aristocrat, and she was a fun, kooky character I, in that previous story, I felt. I'd had some previous heads up that she was going to be reappearing in this book, I think a couple of people have commented on my other Gardner videos and I saw that and people were saying, that, oh, she does come back, so I thought like, oh, okay, well, if this is how she comes back and she's blown up and then it gives Bond some personal stakes in the investigation, maybe she has a, a past, she's a very, you know, affluent, well-connected character, it makes sense that she might have had some interesting dealings in the past, so I imagined that the story would go into some of her backstory in a little more detail. So Bond is sent over to the US to investigate, he's collaborating with the FBI, and then we get a twist really early on, because chapter one ends with Suki Tempesta turning up at Bond's hotel room alive and well. She tells Bond that she received a letter from him telling her not to travel on the ill-fated plane. The letter was obviously forged and there's this whole thing about Suki's family, she has these stepsons, and they have dealings with Harley Bradbury, um, who is quickly earmarked as the potential villain of the piece, the owner of the airlines, one of which blew up. Bond gives Suki some instructions about, you know, laying low and getting out of there and all that kind of stuff. He's fearing for her life at this point, and yeah, it turns out that he wasn't wrong <laughs> because she's dead again by the end of chapter three. She's in a car accident and she gets burnt up as a result of that accident, and you know what? I have to admit, I took this at face value. I 
Did not expect Suki to reappear from this point on. We'll get there. So Bond is doing his investigating and we learn about a villainous organization known as Cold, who are suspected to be behind all of this. And you could tell that Gardner is struggling to describe this particular group so that they don't come across just like a Spectre clone or like the same kind of extremist religious cult that he had in the villains in Scorpius. This is a conversation that Bond's having with one of the FBI agents. Rob almost jumped out of his seat. What do you know about Cold? Not a damn thing. I just heard the name. I gather it's an acronym. Okay, let me spell it out for you. Cold stands for the Children of the Last Days. Sounds like one of these nutty religious groups. It is, in a way. In another way, it is not. In some ways, it's like one of these private militias you've been hearing so much about in the papers, and they aren't funny, I can tell you. No, Cold is an organization spread across the country and made up of people who've been put out of business by our clampdown on organized crime. Some are ex-mobs, some are crazies, dangerous crazies, and some, mainly the people at the top, are highly intelligent criminals who see themselves as the answer to all the country's ills. They don't have the philosophy of the militia that the people need to protect themselves against the federal government. These people believe that the only way to fight crime is by putting criminals into the government. Which I get, but then they're also a group that have all of these like extreme moral positions about things like drugs and abortion, and they're determined to inflict this kind of like Old Testament way of order onto the United States. For instance, they're all for enforcing an anti-drug program, but they would do it their way by killing off pushers and addicts alike. On the abortion issue, they are prepared to close down every clinic or hospital that performs abortions, only they'd close them down with bombs and guns. They'd levy taxes as well, which means that they would lift money from the wealthy by every kind of fraud in the book. Cold would probably give some of it back to the poor and sick, but they'd keep half of it for themselves. They call themselves children of the last days because they believe that we are in the last days. The days which will spell an end to the kind of democracy for which this country stands. Sure, they'd put paid to a lot of crime, but they'd do it by ruthless criminal means and they would end up virtually running the country through fear. It'd be the worst possible thing to happen. It's like looking back to the old fascist days in Italy and Germany when Hitler and Mussolini made the trains run on time and built good roads. The concept of law would be gone forever, together with the concept of justice. So I'm inventing the John Gardner drinking game every time he mentions Hitler you have to take a swig. So the Tempesta boys, uh, Suki's stepsons, are supposedly in league with Cold, and Bond goes to their home to investigate further, and there's this really odd chunk of the thing where one of their wives attempts to seduce Bond. But anyway, Bond comes to learn of a General Brutus Clay, who is said to be a big wig in Cold, and there's a load of stuff that happens here, building up to the climax of part one of the book, which I actually really enjoy. Like, Em is kidnapped, and Bond and Clay are involved in this epic helicopter battle. I really had serious flashbacks to Mission Impossible Fallout when reading those passages, and quite genuinely it's one of my favourite like action sequences in all of Gardner. I thought that it was really well described and tense. Uh, M is in one of these helicopters himself, and you know, yeah, we've had M kidnapped before in Colonel Sun, but there's been such a gap for me personally between reading that book and this book that the repetition didn't bother me too much. Anyway, part one of the book ends with uh, this General Clay seemingly still alive after surviving his helicopter crashing. M is rescued and Bond is taken off the cold investigation. They decide that they're just going to leave it to the Americans. Gardner then gets us up to speed with the events that occurred in the interim, most notably Bond meeting and falling in love with Flicker von Gruse, as part two of the story picks up immediately after the end of Seafire, where Flicker has been beaten up really badly and is in need of some serious medical attention. You know, it's interesting, some people commented uh, that they found it odd that I, uh, in my previous, in my review of Seafire, I kind of took the ending as like a bit of a happy ending. Oh, hooray! Flickers alive kind of thing. Uh and they were kind of like, oh, I thought it was a bit more sort of downbeat than that. And yeah, when I, I did go back and revisit the final few pages of Seafire after reading those comments, and I was like, oh, right, yeah, God, I guess the intention is that it's it's not, oh, hooray, she's alive. It's more like, oh, God, she's barely alive. Anyway, she spends most of her time in this story uh, in hospital in a coma, and Bond is obviously severely depressed about this, but he receives a message from another Bond girl from Gardner's past, in this case, B Beatrice Maria Darici, who is an agent that Bond worked with in Win, Lose or Die, which was the, the which was the Top Gun <laughs> Gardner story, or the one where he saves Thatcher, Reagan, and Gorbachev at the end. Uh, you know, wh wh whichever detail sticks out to you most. It's interesting that Gardner went for so long without ever even referring to Bond girls from his own previous adventures, but in this in this one we get three. I mean, in all honesty, though, I quite like it, even if what they're gonna do 
do with Suki is really weird and out of the blue. He has introduced so many Bond girls throughout his tenure, and a good handful of them Bond said he was in love with, so I like that he is finding a way to repurpose them in this story rather than just create another endless stream of fellow agents for Bond to be teaming up with. Anyway, Bond and Beatrice are now investigating Cold together. There are suspicions that the organization is now up to something big, even all these years later, and it's during these chapters that we see Bond and Beatrice getting very close. Uh, I can't say that Win, Lose, or Die was one of my favorite Gardner stories, so I have no residual love for the character, and in fact, I'd completely forgotten about her. But Bond is kind of talking about her as like, oh, she's the one that got away, and sure enough, they get right back at it, which feels a little gross, given that Flicker is still alive and in hospital in a coma at this point. This is uh, just the start of a love scene between Bond and Beatrice. Oh, and for some reason, they refer to Flicker as Freddy in this story for the most part, which is really odd, because she was she was always Flicker in the other ones. Anyway, she went very solemn. Your friend, Freddy, is she really very bad? The worst. They don't give her much of a chance of recovery. You going to be able to cope with that? I'm already coping with it, Beatrice, my dear. I know that we're not going to be together for the rest of our lives. You being unfaithful to her, James? I haven't been running around... How would Eddie put it? Boffin the bimbos, probably. He wickedly imitated Eddie's pronunciation of the word, probably. They both laughed then. I'm not a bimbo, James, she said in a small voice. I know, dear Beatrice. Oh, I do know. They reached for each other at the same moment and his mouth searched for hers. When their lips met and their mouths opened, it was as though two people had been parched with thirst for an age. Years, maybe. The bit where Bond talks about, like, I know we're not going to be together for the rest of our lives cuts a little bit deep, particularly, like, particularly because, as I said, I revisited the last few pages of Seafire prior to you know, this video. And literally, the last exchange that they have in that book is, um, she tried to smile through the pain, then with great effort, will you still love me tomorrow, James? Tomorrow and for all time, my darling girl, he said. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess you don't love her enough to stick with her. So it just feels a little bit icky. I mean, I know this is James Bond, but I don't know, with how much emphasis was on the idea of him being so in love with Flicker, and she's in this really awful state in hospital, and he's just like, oh yeah, there's a <laughs> another one for me to sleep with, great. And you know, given that I probably like Flicker more than I've liked any other Gardner Bond girl, uh, like I like the shakeup that she brought to the format in Seafire, and I'm just a little bit disappointed that at this stage it looks like she isn't going to be the one that Gardner's Bond ends up with, and um, indeed, immediately after that love passage that I just read to you, Bond gets word that Flicker has indeed died. Now this conflicts somewhat with the detail that Gardner inserted into his Goldeneye novelization, referring to Flicker, where Bond says that she'll, uh, he makes reference to the fact that she'll never walk again. Now, presumably Goldeneye takes place after the events of Cold, given how this story is going to end with Bond meeting a new female M. So, on reflection, it seems a bit odd that Bond would use, you know, the term she'll never walk again as a phrase to describe Flicker's condition to Natalia in Goldeneye. Like, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, she won't be walking again. I mean, there, there are many other things that she won't be doing again, like breathing, for example, but I can only assume that this discrepancy in continuity came about from... Like, maybe Gardner didn't know he was going to kill off Flicker when he was writing the Goldeneye novelization. It just bothers me that he would even go to the effort of mentioning Flicker in Goldeneye. Like, I mean, that book could just easily sit outside his continuity. It's like, it's only really the mention of Flicker that kind of ropes it all in. Uh, you know what, maybe he just didn't care at this point, and hey, maybe I shouldn't either. Anyway, Bond and Beatrice's investigations take them back to General Clay, who suffered horrific injuries as a result of the helicopter crash from earlier, but fortunately for him, it hasn't affected his love life, as Suki Tempesta is revealed to be alive and engaged to the villain. So yeah, twist again. Um, at a point in the book, there is reference made to this, like, female bigwig in Cold, and I must say, up until reading that, I had just taken it at face value that Suki was indeed dead, and then I read that, and then knowing how much Gardner loves his twists and double crossings, I was like, well, okay, when it comes to female characters, there's Suki and Flicker, and I'm not sure that either would make much sense at this point, but it's gonna be one of them, and indeed it is Suki who is just completely mad now, apparently. She He's stark raving bonkers, and like many Gardner villains, like this is just like th th this is just the the reasoning behind her doing completely baffling things, like. 
making James Bond give her away at her wedding to the general, which is definitely one of the crazier bits I've read of any Bond story, and that's saying something by this point of Gardner's run. So Cold have a little, like, evil conference here, and Bond and Beatrice are able to escape capture, and they listen into this, and basically Cold are gonna bomb a bunch of sites in the US and try and take control of the government by force. They still have this whole, like, Cold wanting to inflict this extreme Old Testament morality on the country, but it just doesn't really gel at all with what General Clay is described like, what the Tempesta brothers are described like, that this whole, like, moralistic crusade that they have as an organization just doesn't ever really correlate with anyone <laughs> that I that uh, we read running this organization. At this point in Gardner's run, I'm surprised he didn't just resurrect Spectre, or indeed the, the Scorpius um, sect from that, because that dealt with a bunch of like religious fanatics. I don't know why he felt the need to invent this new- I guess it gives him a, a good title. So Clay is the main villain. All the stuff about the Bradbury guy, the airline owner, is just complete red herring. Um, Clay, you, like I say, you expect him to be this really pious, moralistic crusader, but he doesn't really come across that way. He kills Suki on their wedding night. She finally actually dies, and even then I was kind of half expecting her to turn up at any point later on. Like, this is literally the third time she dies in this book. But yeah, it's implied that she was going to kill the general in bed while having sex with him on their wedding night. As Bond stepped inside, he froze in shock. The centerpiece of the room was a huge circular bed, above it a canopy of glass. Suki Tempesta lay naked and sprawled across the bed, her head twisted oddly to one side and streaks of blood drying rapidly from from the long slices and cuts crisscrossing her body. You bastard, he yelled at Brutus Clay. You sadistic bastard. The general turned and looked him straight in the eye. She was no good to me, Bond. Only good for one thing, and that ended last night. You do realize that she was a diagnosed psychopath. Did you know that she actually killed her husband, Luigi and Angelo's father? She killed him as she made love to him. Poor old man. Throttled him. Gave much pleasure doing that to old Pascal. Then one night it went too far. Like it went too far last night. So that's weird, because it was like, well, alright, well, was Suki gonna kill the general then? Like, was, was she on Bond's side over? It's just, it, it's really odd and strange and just like repurposing that character into such an extreme fashion, like just saying, oh well, she's gone nuts and, and that's it. That's the excuse for, you know, how she, well, all this erratic behavior. Um, it's, it's very odd. Anyway, the climax is not as exciting as the helicopter sequence earlier on, but hey, it's a climax. Uh, it's a very it's a very typical Gardner ending. The villains are assembled in a remote location, Bond calls in the cavalry, and the general is killed trying to escape, and that's that. So the final chapter of the book is called Facing the Music, and it really does have quite a sense of melancholy about it. Bond collects Flicker's ashes with Beatrice, uh, and then the new female M sends some officials to bring Bond into the office. Um, again, Gardner Gardner must have known that this was going to be his final Bond book. Uh, there are a few final passages uh, as Bond is being taken to MI6 that just have a real sense of finality about them. A shade chilly for this time of year, Bond said, but neither man answered. The job was to bring him in for a dressing down from the new boss. He smiled to himself, suddenly remembering the Winston Churchill speech he had memorized at school. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Under his breath he said, Good with words, Churchill. Very good with words. Given Gardner's frequent, like, leaning into World War II history and the like, it does feel somewhat appropriate that he is ending his tenure as a Bond, you know, author with a Churchill quote of all things. Uh, I also think that there is perhaps some meta elements to be read into some of the comments uh, that the old male M makes to Bond in that final chapter. The message light was blinking on the answering machine, so he wound back the tape and played it. James, my boy, you'll have heard that I've retired. M's voice, nostalgia. The question is, did I fall, or was I pushed? Nobody seems to know where you've got to, and, of course, I couldn't give them any help with that. Nip over to see me when you've got a minute, will you? There's a good chap. As for my successor, in confidence, her bark is worse than her bite. So, did Gardner fall, or was he pushed? Uh, we may well talk about that in a future video. So, that is cold, and as a finale to Gardner's tenure, I thought it was alright. I felt somewhat rewarded in all honesty for having read all of the other ones by, you know, having these returning characters come back. I mean, most of Gardner's books you can probably just pick up and just out of continuity and just read them, it doesn't really matter. Cold, though, is probably the only one where I think you would be considerably lost if you hadn't read some of his previous ones. Um, 
mostly because of Flickr, to be honest. Again, the helicopter sequence was a real highlight. I mean, you know, it, the story is full of the usual Gardner trappings. There's some mind-numbingly bizarre twists and contrivances and something of a confused villainous organization at the head of the whole evil scheme. And yet, maybe it's because it's the last one and I'm just delirious with joy, but I did have fun reading it. Um, when it comes to ranking, I am just gonna put it just below License Renewed and above the GoldenEye novelization. Cold is definitely one that I would only recommend to people if you're reading all of Gardner's run. I don't think that it is one that you can just pick up and run with, but as a final chapter in this Bond continuation author's run, I thought it was just about as fine a conclusion as I could have hoped for. Praise indeed, eh? <laughs> but this is not going to be the last time we discuss John Gardner on this channel. I actually have another video planned talking about Gardner's run as a whole, some broad observations as well as my recommendations for which of his books I would recommend a newcomer seek out to just kind of get a flavour of his tenure without having to read the whole continuity. And the three books that I would recommend, there's only one in my own top three list that I would say go for it if you're a newcomer. There are a couple of more that I think would actually be more fitting for a newcomer to read first, but um, we'll discuss that in the future. <laughs> and then after that, Ronda Raymond Benson. We're actually going to be reading a different author's Bond stories. I'm so excited. As with Gardner, I'm going to be working my way through his stories chronologically, and that is going to be including short stories and novelizations, so I hope you will join me for that. And I also just want to say thank you so much to those of you who've really stuck with me during this very long journey through the John Gardner continuation novels. I do really appreciate that these books are something of a niche uh, corner of the James Bond phenomenon, and I, you know, seeing people's comments and getting involved in some chat about the books has really kept me going through some of the darker moments of this read-through, so I just want to say Thank you so much. I really do appreciate. Cheers. So on that note, Bond fans, here's to us and here's to John Gardner as well. I'm not about to inflate my opinions of his work just because this is the last one. But you know what? He did keep literary Bond rolling through the 80s and much of the 90s. And after something of a Bond novel drought, he kept it going for nearly two decades. So I'll toast to that. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. There's links below to my various social media pages if you want to follow me on those. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.